So how do we actually design an email? Well, of course you need to have the sender information, and that might seem obvious, but in fact, you can think about like, who it actually says it's sent from. Is it sent from the CEO? Is it sent from the PR? Is it sent from a person, right? Or is it sent from the company? And these are all things you can try and address through A-B testing as well. You can think about different subject lines, uh, and you can think about what we call the pre-header, which is usually a line or two just above the header as well as the header. And you can even have a personalized greeting, right? So you can have an actual, like, hello, Bob, hello, Mary, right? That actually tries to bring it in specifically to them. You then have the body of the text, the low footer line, and an unsubscribe link at the bottom as well, right? And that's all content that you can add directly onto the email, and you can play a little bit around with how that has. Emails should be created and viewed as HTML for most desktop and mobile devices, right? Nowadays, that works for almost anything. Um, and that, the nice thing about that is that it's just like designing a web page. It's very simple. It's something you can easily do without too much effort in terms of um, learning any new skills. Um, and nowadays, with things like, um, uh, sorry, with, with uh, different email uh, contacts out there, um, it can be very easy, like constant contact, uh, to create this, this in a nice, easy to use interface design. Your goals and KPIs should be supported by the email, right? Text links and call to action buttons should be monitored through click-throughs and you should see how well the email is doing and actually driving the business goals you want. Well crafting and enticingly written will often, emails will often get results and you should be constantly test, test, test to see whether or not the way you're putting your emails together is actually working. You can create content that has value, which is something that users really want. The newsletters can offer humor, insights, information, promotions, exclusive content, and as much as possible, that should be guided by your brand voice, right? Like you have a brand voice guideline they created, and you should be following that when writing these emails. As much as possible, you should be publishing on a consistent basis, right? You shouldn't go one week, skip three weeks, publish again, but doing it on a regular basis, which really helps to establish a trust in the brand. Always you should start with the most important information about the fold, it should be easily scannable in order to see what is actually in it. Email links are interesting, right? Putting links in your email are interesting because they necessarily lead your users away from your content. So you want to make sure those links are valuable whenever you happen and whenever you create them. Email subject lines have been shown again and again to be the key to determining whether or not someone will open them. In most cases, the only way they have to decide about what to, whether or not to open a particular email is by looking at the subject line. As much as possible, the content structure should support that and should be familiar to uh, the user. If a newsletter contains a lot of content, it's advising to have like little snippets with links right, uh, with the full articles displayed otherwise. Otherwise, the email is just going to get overwhelming with pages after pages of content. Um, and that can be daunting for time uh, people who don't have a lot of time, uh, and they may not like go all the way through the newsletter. Um, so it helps to kind of make sure that you adjust your content display appropriately. You can personalize the email using the recipient's name. You can identify uh, the correct structure of the email, like if they want HTML or text. Nowadays, almost everyone wants HTML. You can do a sophisticated measurement of a of recipient's preferences. For instance, you know, not a lot of tools make this easily available, but there's no reason why I shouldn't be monitoring exactly what links a particular user is e clicking on on a regular basis and then emailing them more of that content in the future. And so you could eventually see tailoring the content directly to you, right? That's not something that's currently capable in a lot of today's uh, tool sets, but it may be possible in the near future. Of course, you also have to think about when to time your emails. There's many standard rules that exist, like email three times a day, email in the morning, email in the afternoon. But the only solution, the only uh, real kind of piece of advice I have for you is really test it for yourself. Your customers are your customers and no one else's customers. They're going to want to read email at different times than other people will, right? Um, now, they may generally overlap in some respects, but in general, you should really find out what your customers are like. This graph over here is actually um, related to activity on Twitter, not on email, but I thought it was intriguing, right, because it kind of shows how you could measure over time when people are active and then try and identify peak periods to engage with them as a result of your testing and your examination. So every email deliverer, everyone who's deliver, sending out emails has a reputation score. And this is a score given to the company depending on how well their emails are regarded by the ISPs and subscribers, right? You want to protect that score because if you don't have a high reputation score, your emails are less likely to get delivered. 
In order to do that, you should use authentication standards whenever possible to really uh, make sure that the ISPs know that you're sending the content you're sending. You should keep a tightly maintained smaller email database, right? Keep it clean as much as possible so that you're not spamming people who no longer want that email. Uh, ensure that you're not sending out too many emails too often because that can also take a negative hit. And you should always respond to complaints and unsubscribes. And you should educate users about whitelists. So almost all major mail programs allow you to establish a blacklist, which will um, basically delete any email sent from that user, or a whitelist, which says ignore all the spam protection, I want the email from this user. So as much as possible, it's great to have people put you on that whitelist so that your content doesn't get lost in a spam folder for a while. As we mentioned before, you can look at number of emails delivered, you can look at bounces, and there's a difference between a soft bounce um, versus a hard bounce. A soft bounce is simply saying we can't deliver this piece of content right now, but we might do it at some point in the future. Versus a hard bounce is something like that user no longer exists. So a soft bounce is, for example, would be like that user has too much mail in their mailbox, right? So as soon as they reduce it, you'll be able to email them again. Uh, you can track the number of unique emails open. I described that a little bit before by how using the tracking pixels this tied to each and every individual who has emailed a, that particular email, right? You can look at unsubs, you can look at pass on rates, which is how often is the email passed on to someone else and then they click on something. You can look at click through rates and you can look at conversions, actual sales. It's important to remember that you can A-B test email like you can and everything else. You, the way you do it is slightly different than you do in a website. Um, you basically send two different versions to two different small sub-segments of your email list, and you choose a particular measure to optimize, uh, op optimize like open rates. You then conduct an A-B test to determine which version is sent to the rest of the, the, the group. Now the answer in this case may be that it doesn't matter, that, that both versions do equally well, in which case you, you can either run a bigger version of the test, or you can just send it out and say it doesn't really matter which one you send out. You can test things like the number of links, the copy style and length, the videos, uh, the balance of text and images, and those would all be fairly important. The most common, uh, the A-B testing is by far the most common form of, of, of email testing. Um, and people look at things like open rates across different subject lines and delivery times, the optimal number of links in email to guarantee click-through rate and conversions, the different copy uh, styles, the style, the way you write the email and the copy length, and the effect of video and images, for instance, on the overall open rate. Email is really great because it has a higher return on investment than other app marketing activities in many cases. It's very cheap, cheap to get out, and it allows this mass customization as we discussed through uh, technology. Moreover, it can really help you establish a good relationship with the user, which can equate to a higher customer lifetime value. It's, higher, it's highly, highly measurable. However, email fatigue is a concern. People tend to not be as interested in email nowadays because they get so much spam email. Uh, and it can be very hard to create fresh and new content that actually draws uh, consumers in. Um, you, and so it, email is a powerful tool, but one that can be difficult to use at times, and you really have to work on it to get it to work well.